start too early. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Placer County Board of Supervisors special meeting on Monday, November 13th, 2023. We will begin our meeting with a flag salute led by County Council Karen Schwab. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now is the time for public comment. Persons may address the board on items not on this agenda. Please limit comments to three minutes per person since the time allocated for public comment is 15 minutes. If comments cannot be heard within the 15 minute time limit, the public comment period will be taken up at the end of the regular session. The board is not permitted to take any action on items addressed under public comment. Is there any public comment? Is there anyone online? No, All righty, then we will close public comment and move to board member and county executive reports. Any uh, board member reports or county executive reports? All right, I see none. So now we'll move on to, wow, uh, on to our department head item. This is item 6A, Community Development Resource Agency funding an agreement with the Placer Conservation Authority for the Bickford Ranch Specific Plan open space fee. Here she comes. <laughs> Good morning, Michelle. Good morning. Now, huh? no, Greg's running in behind me. <laughs> So good morning, uh, uh, Chairman Holmes and members of the board, Michelle Kingsbury with the Community Development Resource Agency. Um, the item before you today is to approve a funding agreement with the Placer County Conservation Authority, or PCA, as it relates to the Bickford Ranch specific plant open space fee. Uh, the purpose of the fee, excuse me, I'll back up a little bit. In the development agreement for the Bickford Ranch specific plan, the, um, the development is required to pay an open space fee um, that open space fee has always been intended as a contribution toward the PCCP, PCCP plan, I'll say that five times, to offset acquisition costs associated with that program. Um, we'd like to move this item forward today, which memorializes that um, intent for use of those fees. Um, the, basically what the agreement states is that on an annual basis, those fees collected during that year period, we would transfer over to the PCA to be used um, associated to be used for purposes associated with the PCCP plan. Um, and it's a good thing to do as we're all getting older to start to memorialize these agreements so folks don't forget what the use of these fees are for. Um, and we'll get uh, this item booked into our accounting system so that on an annual basis we can just sweep these fees over to the PCA for their use. So with that, um, we are anticipating the PCA to also hear this item uh, at their board in January. Um, but Greg and I are both available to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, any questions, Supervisor Gore? Thank you, thank you, Michelle. I'm just clarifying, right? So this is a fee for future open space that the PCA will utilize. But um, the project itself has a lot of open space. Is that correct? So this isn't, this fee doesn't mitigate all, correct? Because it's a, it's a fairly small fee, but the, the project itself also has open space. So that's counted towards the mitigation in total for Bigford, Bigford Ranch. Right, the Bigford Ranch specific plan is approximately 60% open space when the golf course was basically removed and that converted to open space area. This fee is what we call a development agreement fee. It's above and beyond fee that's specific to the Bigford Ranch specific plan area. No other developments pay it, um, but it was just a negotiated fee um, to be used for the purposes of supporting the PCCP plan. Great, thank you. Of course, thank you. 
And uh, Su Supervisor Jones. Yes, good, good morning, Michelle. How are you today? Good morning. I'm just curious, how do you calculate the fee? How, how's the, calcu the fee calculated and how much will they owe at this time? Sure, the fees morphed over time with the last development agreement amendment back in 2015. It was reduced to, in total, about $500,000. And what we do is take that and amortize it across the units. So it equated at that time in 2015 to about $265 a unit. It has an escalator or an annual escalation. Um, I think it's a little over $300, if my memory serves me correct, as to what the fee is today. And we charge that per building permit issuance. So we have issued, I think, four model home permits so far in Bigford with another 11, I believe, coming for a total of 15. And those would be paying um, these fees. And then each unit thereafter, when they get their building permit, would pay the fees. And then the fee will be on their tax statement, and it'll increase by a little bit every year? Or it's no? not on the tax statement. It's just a one-time fee due one at building permit issuance. OK. OK. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address? Is there anyone in the audience? <laughs> so, uh, is there anyone online? All right, I'll bring it back to the board for approval. I'll second. Uh, motion by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Landon. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. We'll now move to item number 7A, agreements for intergovernmental transfer of public funds. Uh, Vicki Grenier. Hi, Vicki. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, board members. My name is Vicki Grenier, Deputy Director of HHS for Administrative Services. I'm here today to request the approval of amendments to the non-monetary agreements with Placer County's two current Medi-Cal Medi managed care plans Anthem Blue Cross and California Health and Wellness Plan. For the period of January 1st, 2022 to December 31st, 2025, in addition to the agreement with the California Department of Healthcare Services, DHCS, for the intergovernmental transfer of public funds for the period of January 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2025. I appeared before your board last year requesting similar agreements and would like to share some of the background related to the intergovernmental transfer of public funds, also known as IGT. The IGT process is a funding strategy under the Social Security Act, whereby states or local governments can utilize state or local funds to increase federal matching dollars from Medicaid programs. California currently receives 50% for services provided through Medi-Cal. Currently, the state claims federal funds for use in the Medi-Cal system at a rate which is less than the maximum allowable federal funding level. The difference between the maximum level and the amount drawn down by the state is also known as headroom or unused federal reimbursement. This amount is available to be drawn down through an IGT by counties or other public entities covered by a Medi-Cal managed care plan. To secure these funds, the county transfers required matching funds to DHCS for local health expenditures on behalf of the Medi-Cal population. DHCS then uses the matching funds to draw down additional federal funding from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Once DHCS receives the federal funds, it then transfers the federal and the matching funds to Medi-Cal managed health care plans for that county. These plans then make payments to the IGT contracted Medi-Cal providers. The overall result to the county is that it receives back all the transferred matching and federal funds, less a 20% DHCS administrative fee, and a 2 to 2.5% managed care plan administrative fee. I believe in the memo it said that was a 2% fee. One of the plans is 2% and one is 2.5%, so I just wanted to note that. If your board against votes to participate in this funding strategy, the net revenue increase to Placer County will be approximately $3.4 million. The additional Medicaid funds must be used for the provision of health services to the Medi-Cal enrollees and cannot be transferred into the county's general fund. There is no county general fund impact as a result of these requested actions. Please consider the requested actions related to the intergovernmental transfer of public funds to participate in this funding opportunity, will, which enable HHS to provide future Medi-Cal services for Placid County residents. Thank you for your consideration. Any questions, comments for both? Supervisor Gore. Uh, no questions, but boy, 
Now you know why government is so complicated. <laughs> I read that. I read that your staff report, and I thought we're going to put money here, and then you have to put money here, and then it goes here, and that it's like a shell game. This is the most complicated really item that we have. <laughs> so thank you. I just it really blows my mind at how complicated the state of California and the federal government can make things. But I appreciate your hard work. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? Uh, anyone in the audience wish to address this item? Anyone online? No. Has the uh, action request have been um, read into the? Yes. No, we didn't even read it into the record. Pardon? I'm a, no, I want to know if the action request has, has been read, read into the. We need to read it into the record. Oh. oh. Oh, one page fast. I wonder it wasn't making I can sense. bring Amy up too if you want to do something. Okay. okay. So we're going to do all three at one time? Or, yes. Okay. Yeah. Approve an amendment to the agreement with Anthem Blue Cross for coordination of Medi Cal benefits to eligible persons to add capitation rate range increases and add an additional year for a revised period of January 1, 2022 to December 31, 2025 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to sign the amendment with risk management and county council a concurrence and to sign subsequent amendments <coughs> consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. And second, to an approved amendment to the agreement with the California Health and Wellness Plan for coordination of Medi-Cal benefits to eligible persons to add capitation rate range increases and add an additional year for a revised period of January 1, 2022 to December 31, 2025 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to sign the amendment with risk management and county council concurrence and to sign subsequent amendments consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Third is to approve an agreement with the California Department of Health Care Services for intergovernmental transfer of public funds with Anthem Blue Cross and California Health and Wellness Plan for the period of January 1, 2022 through June 30, 2025. And authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to sign the agreement and amendments consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Good job. <laughs> Thank you, Supervisor Jones. I'll second. Thank you. <laughs> okay, motion, Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank you, Vicki. Thank Spare you so much. <laughs> now we'll move to item 7B, North Valley Behavioral Health Lotus Behavioral Health Crisis Respite Care Services. Yes. Good morning. Hi, Amy Ellis here, your Director of Adult System of Care. Um, good morning, Chair Holmes and members of the board. Um, so today I have two action items. One is to approve uh, the award of request for proposals number 20406, Behavioral Health Crisis Center Operator to uh, North Valley Behavioral Health. And the second is to approve an agreement with North Valley Behavioral Health for Lotus Crisis Respite Care Services in the amount not to exceed $1 million. $337,368 from December 1st, 2023 through November 30th, 2024, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execute the agreement with risk management and County Council concurrence and to sign subsequent amendments up to $100,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and County Council concurrence. So back in September of 2022, uh, you may remember that the Health and Human Services Adult System of Care Division, we launched LOTUS, which is a six bed short term behavioral health crisis respite center on the Kirby Hills campus in Roseville. Um, due to the program's success um, during that pilot, that first year pilot phase, it has, was decided to do a request for proposals to seek the best partner to continue to operate the service. So on August 24th, 2023, 
the, that RFP went out and a panel was determined that the panel determined unanimously that North Valley Behavioral Health should be awarded the RFP to continue the service. They were our same partner during the pilot phase. Um, the program will continue though to operate together with contracted North Valley staff and county staff um, operating together to, to build the best outcomes. So Lotus is open to anyone in our community, regardless of insurance type or level of need. It serves individuals who are experiencing any type of behavioral health crisis. The model's built on being easy to access, welcoming to all, therapeutic and helping individuals create a plan to stabilize their crisis and enter services. So during the pilot phase, Lotus served 961 individuals uh, referred by local emergency departments, law enforcement, shelters, other community-based organizations, and self-referrals. Um, the average length of stay was about 20 hours and about 80% of Lotus clients rated that the Lotus met, the Lotus met my needs um, and successfully completed treatment and did not require a higher level of care. So the clients were safely discharged back to the community with linkage and resources for behavioral health and other necessary resources. So I will mention too during the pilot phase the, the utilization was um, a kind of a slow to start. So we maybe averaged two to three individuals per night that first year, which was making us a little nervous because we thought we'd have higher utilization. But in the last few months, we have seen that rise to about four to five per night utilization. So we're still not maxing out on our utilization, which is good, um, but we are seeing that increase of utilization. So the total cost of the contract is $1,337,368, and the funding for the agreement is available in uh, the fiscal year 23-24 budget for the adult system of care with no additional uh, impact to the general fund. Happy to take any questions on this item. Uh, Supervisor Gore. Thank you, Amy. Really good to hear about the program and how it's working. Question for you, and you said that about 80%, um, once they come in, they're there for about 20 hours, don't actually receive or need future or additional services. So can you give me an idea of maybe why somebody might end up there and then they get stable and move on? I'm just, yeah. I think it'd be helpful to understand that. Yeah, so uh, they just don't need a higher level of care. Okay. So we're talking, we'll track for individuals who use Lotus, how many of them higher would be considered going to our psychiatric health facility, which is also on that same cam campus, but requires an involuntary hold re um, versus Lotus, which offers a lot of support but for in a voluntary manner. So I think what we're saying is that 80% of them voluntarily are working with us and choosing to engage in that next level of service without having to go that involuntary higher level of care path. Great, thank you very much, I yeah. appreciate the clarification. Supervisor Jones. <clears throat> yes, good morning, Amy, thank you. Um, what was the pilot period? It was, it started uh, from, uh, let's see, what date did I say? September 2022, and then it went about a year. So we went forward in August. So let's see, yeah, a month before the year ended with the RFP. And I think that little, so it was a year. It was basically one year. Any variance in that would just be that administrative time to get to the new contract. Okay, so um, 961 individuals in a year. That's, that's quite a few though. It is, it's just, uh, it's like numbers of served as unique individuals versus um, how many people are there at one time, like, like utilization. So I just wanted to point out that it is, it was really great that we were serving that many people, but it's also great to see that it's more than one or two per night, that um, each night now it's more like four to five. So our numbers served will, pro will also be higher in probably the next reporting period. Is it a matter of people just not knowing about it yet? I mean, it's a fairly new program. I think it's honestly, it's just uh, also takes a culture change from our community. We're so used to going the involuntary path, so used to just you know going straight to higher levels of care and being kind of conservative in our response, and so not you know needing to build that trust with the community, needing to um, see those good outcomes, and then you'll see that utilization increase. Okay, because this is emergency crisis. Right. It here. is, but it's it's just routing it in a different way than our 
community who usually handles that is used to. So if you always just know when this happens, I go to the hospital, some, we're changing that. Oh, now you can go to this other place and not just the hospital. And when do I decide when to go to the hospital and when do I get, decide to go here? I think it's just a culture change that takes some time. Okay, so they don't have to go to the hospital emergency room. No, they do not. They come to you. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, good. Glad it's in my district. <laughs> Thank you, Amy, for that. Mm -hmm. It's the idea to keep them out of the emergency room and have some crisis, you know, when it's in the middle of the night or whenever uh, yeah. this crisis occurs. Right. Uh, exactly. We want to keep as many from going to the hospital that don't need that. Some people in crisis still do need a medical intervention, mm -hmm. um, but they can call. We walk through that very quickly with the caller okay. and have them come straight over if there's no medical component to okay. that need or send them to the ER if there's a medical component. All right, good. Any other comments? Anyone in the audience wish to address this item? I see none. Anyone online? Alrighty. Then I will entertain a motion. I'll move approval. I'll second. Uh, do you want motion. me to read it into the record? She uh, read it already. Okay, she good. Read it. She actually good. read it, yeah. Okay. Okay, motion by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gustafson. All those in favor, please say, oh, Supervisor. I'm just turning it on to. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't be tricking me. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, thank you. The item is moved. Thanks. I oh, you're not Joey. I think I have C too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's it. All right. All right, item C. Okay. Uh, Amy Ellis again, uh, for the record, Adult System of Care. Uh, this one has four action items, so bear with me. These are a mouthful. Um, to adopt a resolution, okay, number one, approve a revenue agreement with Partnership Health Plan of California to provide enhanced care management to underserved populations from January 1, 2024 through G uh, December 31st, 2024, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to sign the agreement with risk management and county council concurrence and approve automatic renewals for consecutive one-year periods unless otherwise terminated. Number two, to authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee the authority to sign subsequent amendments with Partnership Health Plan of California for enhanced care management consistent with subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Third, to approve a revenue agreement with Partnership Health Plan of California to provide community support services to underserved populations from January 1st, 2024 through December 31st, 2024, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to sign the agreement with risk management and county council concurrence and approve automatic renewals for consecutive one-year periods unless otherwise terminated. Fourth, authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee the authority to sign subsequent amendments with Partnership Health Plan of California for community supports consistent with subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So um, just some background on this one. In 2022, the Department of Healthcare Services developed California Advancing and Innovating Medi-Cal CalAIM. I think you guys have been hearing a lot about CalAIM. <laughs> so a new, this is a new framework for a broader delivery system program and payment reform across the Medi-Cal system, right? So um, as part of CalAIM reform, DHCS implemented what's called enhanced care management we call it ECM for short, and community supports. ECM provides comprehensive case management to high need vulnerable residents to any service that may benefit them. It's got kind of a whole person care approach to it. Um, Placer County's community supports team uh, specifically works with individuals who need help finding housing or maintaining housing placements. Through a Department of Healthcare Services, California contracted with the managed care plans to establish this benefit of ECM and community supports and to get a provider network for Medi-Cal enrollees. So Placer County um, opted to contract with Anthem, Blue Cross, and California Health and Wellness to provide both ECM and community support services. But as you are aware, those managed care plans are leaving Placer County at the end of 2023, and Partnership Health Plan will be the new managed care plan, um, which would, would require a change uh, to these new agreements. So basically, we're off going opting into the same services, but with partnership instead of the other two. 
So uh, we will continue to provide these essential services to our most vulnerable residents under partnership, and there is no net county cost to provide CalAIM ECM and CS services at this time. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for this item? I see none. <clears throat> Anyone in the audience wish to address this item? Seeing none, anyone online? All right, then the chair will entertain a motion. Okay, it's moved motion by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Now we'll move to item 7D, California Department of Social Services for Housing Support Program Allocation. Is that Lisa? Hi, Lisa. Good morning. Lisa Soto, Assistant Program Director with Health and Human Services, the Human Services Division. Good morning, Chair, members of the board. Uh, today I'm here to request the following. To approve the director's certification of the revenue allocation agreement with the California Department of Social Services in an amount not to exceed Seven thousand seven hundred nine four thousand five hundred and twenty four for the housing support program from July 1, 23 through June 30, 2024, and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to sign the agreement and other related documentation with risk management and county council concurrence and to sign subsequent amendments up to seventy nine thousand four hundred fifty two consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Secondly, to authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to accept additional allocations from California Department of Social Services in an amount not to exceed $2 million for the housing support program if they become available from July 1, 2023 through June 30th, 2024. And authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to sign additional allocation agreements or related documentation with risk management and county council concurrence, and to sign subsequent amendments and allocations up to $100,000 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. A little background, uh, through the housing support program, the California Department of Social Services or CDSS will allow CalWORKs families meeting certain criteria and at risk of homelessness to receive rental support before becoming unsheltered. On September 27, 2023, Placer County Human Services was notified that the initial allocation for the 23-24 fiscal year would be 794,524. Placer County has requested additional funds pending availability up to $2 million. Placer County's goal for the housing support program is to provide support to CalWORKs families through the rapid rehousing model, enabling them to quickly obtain permanent housing and achieve self-sufficiency. We've been operating the program since December of 2015, and over 390 homeless families have been helped and housed through the housing support program in the county. We currently have 30 families, including 71 children, that are housed through the program and the contracts to deliver these services are made through our community partners, AMI Housing, Volunteers of America, and Stand Up Placer, who administer the program. Uh, let's see. Approval of the allocation agreement and subsequent amendments will allow human services to provide housing support to more homeless families and at-risk families and to help keep them housed as they learn the skills they need for timely payment of rent, maintaining a good rental history, and accessing needed services. As for fiscal impact, the total amount of this allocation is 794524 Funding is included in the 2023-24 budget for human services, and if the um, additional funds up to two million are received, the funding would be included in the 23-24 human services budget via budget amendment. And there is no additional impact to the general fund. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for uh, Lisa? Supervisor Jones. 
Yes, good morning, Lisa. Good Thank morning. you for that. Um, I'm just curious. The uh, This is referring to people that are at risk of homelessness. So I'm just wondering, how, how do you determine that, that they're at risk? If There's a set of criteria that are established by CDSS. Um, the program initially started and you had to be literally homeless. Mm -hmm. And they realized that was not good for California families. Um, so the criteria expanded in, it was amid the pandemic. And so those that were at risk of losing their housing, perhaps having been served with an eviction notice, lost their job, no immediate resources, could also receive some rental support. Okay, do these people have to already be um, part of the California Works Opportunity and Responsibility? Yes, they have to be involved with the CalWORKS program. Okay, so the CalWORKS program then is assisting them with caring for their children? Yes, they could be eligible to child care services through CalWORKS, um, job development, employment services, whatever they need. Okay, because I know, I know there are a lot of um, families with children. Is it true that they're considered homeless if they're living in someone else's house and not their own home? Yes, potentially. If it's a temporary situation or if folks are what we call couch surfing, couch surfing. Um, right. they may not be welcome there for an extended period of time. Yeah. Um, but in other instances, somebody who's been welcome to stay with the family, um, they may not necessarily be eligible. Mm -hmm. It's really intended to help those that are in greatest need right. and at greatest risk of becoming literally homeless. So it says we're currently serving 30 families, including 71 children doesn't really seem like a very big number for Placer County. I'm sure there's a lot more families probably. How do you reach out or how do those people find out about? They you? find us, I um, have been listed as the point of contact, so I, I don't know exactly where they get my number, but I'm glad they have it because they're coming through a number of channels. They come to us through 211, they come through us through our CalWORK staff who upon doing the initial interview learn of their circumstances and refer them through our employment services programs. Um, as I mentioned, the three community providers are, are good at spreading the word about the program. Good, good, okay, great. Sounds like a great, a great program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Gustafson. Thank you, it is a great program and it's another step in what we're trying to deal with is the issues of homelessness. The, the um, question I have is, is, is there a time duration for them to be recipients? I may have missed it. I thought there was, but I didn't see it. In the there is. The HSP, or Housing Support Program, is a six-month subsidy program, and so it's graduated. The program pays more of the rent At initially, the and the participant pays more of the rent as time goes on. There have been instances where that has needed to extend beyond six months, but that is the, the program baseline. And have we seen people that have gone through the program and then needed to come back later? To we have. On it? And they don't always need the full six months. Uh, sometimes it's just to help prevent eviction. Right. Um, other times we honestly have seen folks that need the full gamut of services again. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address the board on this item? Do we have anyone online? No, All righty, then we'll bring it back to the board for action. Uh, motion by Supervisor Gustafson, second by Supervisor Jones. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. How are we doing? Oh, it's 9.30. We're uh, approached our 9.30 a.m. timed item. This is item one, Health and Human Services Proclamation Adoption Awareness Month, uh, presented by Supervisor uh, Landon. Good morning, Chair Holmes, Supervisors, Mr. Chatney, Ms. Schwab, Twyla Abrahamson, Director of the Children's System of Care, and I'm going to present this item just before the proclamation. Um, since 1976, a week in November of each year has been reserved to share, to raise awareness about the need for adoptive families for children in the foster care system. It has evolved over time to become a month-long celebration 
an opportunity to recognize the efforts of those whose lives have been impacted by adoption and those who facilitate the process. National Adoption Awareness Month encourages individuals, families, and communities to celebrate adoption as a positive way to grow families and help children leave foster care. Each year, the Children's Bureau celebrates National Adoption Awareness Month with a theme. And this year's theme is empowering youth, finding points of connection, to highlight the importance of youth engagement and adoption efforts, including providing opportunities and services that connect youth to their backgrounds to support per permanent relationships. When youth are connected to their roots, they also build meaningful connections, which helps them to explore their identities and plan for the future. Adoption Awareness Month also highlights the fact that children are still waiting for families. Placer County has finalized 24 adoptions so far in 2023, and we anticipate finalizing seven additional on Adoption Day, which is being held this year on Saturday, November 18th from 9 to 12. And so we are requesting that your board take the following action, which is to approve a proclamation declaring November 2023 as Adoption Awareness Month. And there is no fiscal impact to the, as a result of this action. So happy for your consideration and to answer any questions. Uh, Supervisor Landon. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to read it. I don't know. Okay. Let's, <laughs> let's approve the. Okay. The well, I will move approval. Oh, I, th I thought you would. I'll second. <laughs> okay, motion. For public oh, that's right. Public comment. Any public comment on this item? Anyone online? Okay. So, motion by Supervisor Landon, second by Supervisor Jones. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The item is moved. Now you can go ahead and proceed. Okay. Thank you. Well, as um, I know all of you know, four of my kids are adopted from foster care, so I'm very honored and feel privileged to be able to read this proclamation. Whereas November is National Adoption Awareness Month and across the nation more than 114,000 children are waiting for adoptive families. And whereas youth leaving foster care without being adopted or without permanent connections face ongoing challenges with employment, education and mental health, as well as have an increased risk of homelessness and human trafficking. And whereas every child in Placer County, regardless of physical, medical or emotional challenges, age, race or sexual orientation, needs love, support, security, and a permanent place to call home. And whereas during Adoption Awareness Month, we celebrate all of the families who have opened their homes to children through adoption, including all children and youth adopted from foster care within the last two decades in Placer County. And whereas we also recognize those children and youth still waiting to join an adoptive family. There are many children in foster care in Placer County waiting to find their adoptive families. And whereas the children's system of care is committed to supporting children in foster care waiting for adoption and supporting adoptive families through education, services, and support. And whereas the courts in Placer County will open their doors on November 18th to finalize the adoptions of seven local children and join the children's system of care and community organizations to celebrate all adoptions. And now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the above proclamation was duly passed by the Board of Supervisors of the County of Placer on behalf of all citizens of Placer County at a special meeting held November 13, 2023, proclaiming the month of November 2023 as Adoption Awareness Month. All right. Great. Uh, so did you want to take it down and have sure. a photo, or did you want us to join you? Or? Yeah, come join. All right. Thank you for reading that, Supervisor Landon, and also for your family's personal commitment in this area as well. Thank you. Supervisor Landon, I just want to thank you for your 
raising those five children, and but four of them that uh, are doing well in life and they're moving on to college and everything, it's really heartwarming to see uh, that you took, it took the initiative to help those young families and you should be commended for it. So you're welcome. Now where are we? We're gonna to move to our 940 time dynamo in just a few seconds. Yeah, yeah. Time, yeah, time, don't you think? yeah. <laughs> take your time. There we are. Okay. This is a matter of a proclamation Global Entrepreneurship Week. Uh, we are asked to approve and present a proclamation declaring November 13th through the 19th, 2023 as Global Entrepreneurship Week in Placer County. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gloria Stearns with Economic Development. Happy Global Entrepreneurship Week. It is actually this week that we start to celebrate, and it's a worldwide event that they've been doing for a number of years. Over 170 countries participate in this. So we are not alone in recognizing the hard work of the people who choose to start businesses in Placer County and those who have started businesses and they're trying to make them grow. And as a result of that, Placer County has a couple of different resources to help businesses grow. One of those is our business resource center that many of you know about. But right now we're in the middle of reimagining what the business resource center could be. So we call it lovingly our BRC 2.0 study. So we're right in the middle of that figuring out new ways that we were better able to help some of our entrepreneurs and where we fit in with all of the new resources that have recently been added into our area. And I'm gonna take just a second to talk about some of those resources that have been added because there are so many of them and because we have a special person in our audience today. So some of our resources is not only the BRC, but we also have the Growth Factory in Rockland, Roseville's Venture Lab, Sierra College's Entrepreneurial Fellowship Program, William Jessup's Entrepreneurial Program, and Sac State's Carlson Innovation Center. We also have the SBA, the SBC, the SBDC, and any other number of alphabet soup that you can imagine, but all of them, and also GSEC, all of them working together to help our businesses to grow. And I think that's a really important thing. I heard that from you last week in the budget workshop where people were concerned about what's going on with some of our downtown areas, especially in our smaller locations. And I think having more resources like this to support our businesses is extremely important to help those businesses. I also wanted to give you a peek behind the curtain into something that economic development is doing for 2024. Now that we have more staff, thank you, um, our allocations have been filled and I'm pleased about that. We are going to start um, downtown revitalization work groups. So it'll consist of not only staff, but also volunteers to go and consult with little downtowns and help them to figure out what might be slowing them down and what's getting in their way as well as helping the businesses too. So with that, I'm going to request the proclamation be approved at some point. I'm going to request a picture, but I'd also like to introduce Mark Haney, who is one of Placer County's most vocal and active supporters of entrepreneurs to join me for a few minutes just to help you understand the entrepreneurial environment in Placer County. Thank you. Good morning, Mark. Good morning to all of you, and thank you, Gloria. I appreciate the introduction and the kind words about entrepreneurship. As entrepreneurs succeed, we all succeed. And at the Growth Factory, we're building an entrepreneurial development group with an accompanying venture fund and a backyard advantage. And the backyard advantage is really this, uh, this community that's it's, it's most a connected community in the world for local entrepreneurs. And, we're bringing people together with a culture of love, showing love to one another to help them to su succeed because nobody builds a truly great company alone. And so if we can give them a little bit of wind at their back in their journey, then, then that's what we do. So I want to definitely commend Placer County for being forward leaning and specifically the city of Roseville and the city of Rockland for really driving that mindset of innovation and entrepreneurship in their communities. And it's really working out well, but I think we're just at the beginning. So I look forward to applying 
my imagination, if that's helpful to the planning of a more comprehensive strategy driven by the county. So with that said, I'm, I'm open for questions or however you want to utilize me. Mark, I just want to thank you and your family for your leadership in this entrepreneurship. You thank really you. made a big difference in uh, Placer County. Thank you. Uh, entre entrepreneurs. Uh, Supervisor Gore. Uh, thank you, Mark, and I really appreciate your work. I do have a question for Gloria. Um, and Gloria, you had mentioned the downtown re revitalization work groups, which I think is an excellent idea. I'm sure you're partnering with Chambers, but is it um, for incorporated and in unincorporated downtown areas. It's, it's not just unincorporated Placer County, correct? We will go wherever we're needed, and we're hoping to staff it with economic development professionals, chamber professionals, and whoever participates in our economic development stakeholder meetings regularly and offer them that opportunity. We've already done a similar type of work group to study economic incentives. So we're, we work together, and I think that's one of the strongest things that I've seen in Placer County is this sense of collaboration and willingness to help everybody. And the interesting thing was I was just, I'm, I'm smiling at, at Supervisor Gustafson, I was just in DC and it was interesting because a question came up from Roseville and I said, well, I know somebody who's here in DC who is from um, Tahoe and they can answer that particular question. So I made the introduction and I think the more that we can knit these areas together and the tighter, I think they're all, they all have knowledge that's unique and specific, but they can all help each other. And I think seeing that is the best part about working here in Placer County. Right, thank you. I really, I appreciate your efforts and I appreciate your efforts in this area because the, the reality is it's really challenging to start a business. Um, so any supports we can provide and any ways we can continue to streamline, I think that everyone in Placer County, we say that this is a good place to do business, right? But when it's not, we need to help pivot um, so that we can make it easier um, because then it's not just starting the business, then it's, as a business owner surviving and then being successful, right? And so I really appreciate the Business Resource Center um, that we've got programs that can assist, but then we've got programs from the private sector as well, Mark, your group and others. Um, we really do want this to be a place where Placer County businesses um, thrive, are successful, because that just benefits our entire community. Supervisor Lane, um, Jones. Good morning, Gloria and Mark. So um, I understand then the downtown re revitalization is not just in cities. It's also going to include unincorporated areas. Correct. Okay, great. I'll need to get with you on some unincorporated areas. 2024. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we'll project out. And Mark, thank you for, for all that you guys do over there. It's really a wonderful place. If you haven't toured it, you should go tour it. Alrighty, any uh, other comments from pu the public? Anyone online? Alrighty, then having the motion been approved, I will go ahead and read this commendation. I'll move approval. Oh, oh I thought we were. Okay, motion by Su Suzanne Jones, second by Supervisor Gustafson. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, any abstentions, hearing none. Thank you. Alrighty, bear with me. In the matter of a proclamation recognizing November 13th through the 19th, 2023 as Global Entrepreneurship Week in the County of Placer. Whereas California is home to over 4.2 million small businesses that employ 7.43 million people more than any other state. Promoting entrepreneurial spirit is the heart of California today and throughout our history. Whereas Global Entrepreneurship Week is the world's largest celebration of the innovators and job creators who launch startups that bring ideas to life, drive economic growth, and expand human welfare. Whereas the Sacramento region's week-long celebration of entrepreneurship and GEW encompasses dozens of local regional events throughout the greater Sacramento region, each designed to expose citizens and constituents to the six county, in the six county region to the idea of starting and running a business. And whereas these events, from large scale competitions to teaching entrepreneurial skills in our region, regional higher ed institution, connect partnership participants to potential collaborators, mentors, and even investors, introducing them to new possibilities and exciting opportunities. 
And whereas most of the new jobs created through the United States in the past decade have come from the created efforts of entrepreneurs, innovators, and small businesses engaged in endeavors ranging from micro businesses to large scale ventures. And whereas entrepreneurs have been the source of economic innovation throughout our nation's history, and our society has been improved because of new ways of doing things that have been brought about by people who market their ideas. <clears throat> Whereas small businesses are the driver of economic vitality across the region, accounting for two thirds of new jobs, particularly in rural and underserved communities. Whereas Placer County and the entire greater Sacramento region embraces the entrepreneurial spirit, exploring new ideas, seizing opportunities, and acting upon them in a spirited culture, cultural of innovation to create 21st century jobs, a vibrant economy, and a working region where all residents have equal access to economic prosperity and the chance to start and successfully own their own businesses. Now therefore be it proclaimed that the above proclamation was duly passed by the Board of Supervisors of the County of Placer on behalf of the citizens of Placer County at a regular meeting held November 13th, 2023, and does hereby proclaim the week of November 13th through 19th, 2023, as Global Entrepreneurship Week in Placer County. All right, so I'll bring it down. Are you going to join me? <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, let's get up, move around a little bit. Good to see you. How Good to you? see you. I'm doing great. How are you? Good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. You betcha. Now we'll now move to the 9.50 a.m. item, uh, Public Works, a, a Highway 49 Wastewater Capacity Improvement Project. Mr. Chair, yes. um, I request that this item be moved to uh, November the 27th. I believe that um, if Megan could chime in here about the time. Yes, we're gonna move this item to uh, the special meeting on Monday, November 27th. It'll be heard at 9 a.m. or soon thereafter. And I'd request a motion to continue. I move approval. I move that we continue the item. Thank you. Okay, motion by Supervisor Gore, second by Supervisor Jones. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? The item is moved. Thank you. We'll see you next um, November 27th. Item E, Department of Housing and Community Development Allocations. Oh, Good yeah. morning again. So continuing our, our housing theme, um, your board previously approved multiple allocations from the State of California Department of Housing and Community Development to Placer County under the Housing Navigator Program and Transitional Housing Program. Transition age youth between the ages of 18 and 24 sometimes require additional housing support and people to assist them with navigating services to meet their complex and unique needs. There has been growing need in our community for youth finding and maintaining permanent housing. Through a rapid rehousing model, which includes, but is not limited to, appropriate permanent housing unit identification, rental subsidies, moving assistance, move-in costs, such as application fees, rental or utility deposit, credit reports, rent or utility arrears, furnishings and case management, TAY have been more successful in gaining and maintaining 
housing, preventive homeless, preventing homelessness, and other detrimental outcomes. So Placer County Children's System of Care, Adult System of Care, and Human Services Divisions have worked together with the Probation Department to streamline and identify the transition age youth, again those 18 to 24, who are in need of these services. Community providers are providing these housing navigation services through contracts that your board has approved in prior years as well. Thus, contract amendments with community providers would come back to your board again for approval in the coming months if direction is obtained for application and acceptance of these additional rounds of funding. So there are four actions. They're very long. I will read them so Supervisor Jones does not have to. <laughs> So number one, so adopt a resolution to apply and accept the following. Number one, the Transitional Housing Program Allocation Round 5 award issued by the State, Dep uh, the State of California Department of Housing and Community Development in an amount not to exceed $159,840 from July 1, 23 through June 30th, 24, authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to sign the award acceptance and related documentation and to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed an additional $15,984 and add an additional year consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. And Ms. Schwab, should we take all of these individually or together? together. Perfect. Number two, authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to accept additional allocations from the State of California Department of Housing and Community Development in amount not to exceed $319,680 for the Transitional Housing Program Allocation Round 5 award if they become available from July 1, 23 through June 30, 24. Authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to sign the additional allocation agreements or related documentation and to sign subsequent amendments and allocations up to $31,968 and also add an additional year consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. Number three, the housing navigation and maintenance program allocation round two award issued by the state of California, Department of Housing and Community Development in an amount not to exceed $66,322. Authorize the director of health and human services or designee to sign the award acceptance and related documentation and to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed an additional $6,632 and add an additional year consistent with the agreement's subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. And finally, number four, authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to accept additional allocations from the State of California Department of Housing and Community Development in an amount not to exceed $132,644 for the Housing Navigation and Maintenance Program Allocation Round 2 award if they become available from July 1, 23 through June 30, 24 authorize the Director of Health and Human Services or designee to sign additional allocation agreements or related documentation and to sign subsequent amendments and allocations up to $13,264 and add an additional year consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So the total cost of these allocations is $226,162. Funding will be included in 23-24 budget for the Children's System of Care. There's no additional impact to the general fund. And again, this is Twyla Abrahamson for the Children's System of Care, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about this item. Okay. Any questions for, for this item? I see none. Is there anyone in the audience wishes to address the board on this item? Is there anyone online? No, All righty, then I will entertain a motion. I will make the motion to approve, and thank you, Twyla, for reading all that for yes. me. You, you did a great job. I'll second. Okay, motion by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. We'll move to uh, item 8A. 2023-24 Local Transportation Fund, State Transit Assistance, State of Good Repair Claims. Um, Jamie, 
Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Uh, my name is Jamie Wright, and I manage transit services here at the county. Um, before you today, uh, we are requesting um, the adoption of a resolution to execute and submit claims for the fiscal year 23-24 Transportation Development Act. Uh, local transportation fund and state transit assistance funds and Senate bill one state of good repair funds for transit operation and capital assistance as well as road maintenance totaling 10 10 million one hundred and eighty two thousand six hundred and eleven dollars for the Tahoe um, Regional Planning Agency and the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency. Um, so a little bit of background on an annual basis. We do come before you uh, with our annual uh, TDA or Transportation Development Act claim. Um, these uh, funds are uh, provided by the state of California. Uh, LTF, LTF is our local transportation fund, uh, which is a one-fourth cent sales tax collected here in Placer County. And then our STA is um, a diesel tax that's collected in California and um, given back to jurisdictions based on population. Um, SB1 is an additional uh, diesel tax, which does support um, our ongoing maintenance of our fleet, as well as capital investment, in addition to uh, road maintenance um, ongoing uh, needs as well. Uh, so with that, I will uh, take any questions that you may have. Any questions, comments? Supervisor Gustafson. Hi, Jamie. Good to Good see morning. you. Um, the electric charging um, facility that we're going to uh, build up at the um, TARP facility, um, how many buses will that charge at one time? Um, so right now we are going through uh, our design of our transition plan uh, and working with a consultant to do so. We will be starting with four uh, electric buses here in the next couple years. Mm -hmm. uh, the initial uh, phase one charging infrastructure will be three chargers up at TART. Uh, space is becoming an issue up there yeah. for us with all of the different entities that operate. So we are working uh, closely with fleet uh, as well as the roads division to kind of look at a transition plan for all all of us right now mm -hmm. uh, but initially our phase one will be uh, four electric buses with three three chargers at TART. Great and we haven't had a presentation at the board level in a while but recently at one of the MAC meetings uh, Jared Dick gave us a, a presentation on the biomass facility and if that moves forward how we can use that power generated from the biomass to uh, charge the buses so a lot of support in the community to keep finding ways to use those forest products to actually provide transit too. So. Yeah, and, and we're also looking at on-route uh, charging infrastructure and kind of working with our partners in the Yeah, the one at um, South Lake Tahoe at the community college is, is uh, I just took a tour of that. That was a great Yeah, it's a, it's a good facility. Thank you. Right. Any other comments, questions from board members? <laughs> is there anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item? Seeing none, anyone in online? All right. Then I'll ask for uh, a motion to approve. It's a motion by Supervisor Gustafson, second by Supervisor Jones. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The item is moved. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. So now we will move to our. Huh? Oh, it's 10 o'clock. Oh. <laughs> we're a little longer. Okay, we'll move to our 10 a.m. Community Development Resource Agency 2050 General Plan Update Consulting Contract. Chris Schmidt. Morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Board. Chris Schmidt, the Planning Services Division, with an exciting item for the Board to consider. It's a, a consulting contract to update our Placer County General Plan. So as you recall, in November of last year, the, we came before your board to ask to proceed with the long process of updating our county general plan. The board gave us the green light to prepare a scope of work to undertake that effort. And then been back on June 13th, your board authorized us to release an RFP in the scope of work for that update. So just some background on what our general plan is. Uh, California law requires each local government to adopt a general plan. 
those uh, general plan requirements are government code section 65300. The general plan should be a comprehensive, integrated, and internally consistent document with compatible policies. It provides development policies with land use maps. In state preparation for general plan, the guidelines were last updated in 2017. So what is our general plan? It's really the vision for the future. It's not only our roadmap, but also the public's roadmap for the future of the county. It also guides county departmental strategic goals and policies. It is our basis for land use decisions and growth management throughout unincorporated Placer County. It guides our physical appearances and also allows for accountable implementation with programs and policies. So our general plan was last updated in 1994. At that time, it was envisioned as a 10 to 20 year plan. It served us well. We did update the policies in 2013, so we're overdue for a, a relook at our general plan. So why do we update? It's really our opportunity to set a new vision for the county. It'll address current opportunities, challenges, and trends. Our perspectives on land use and environmental issues have changed over the years. There's been significant changes to our demographics and economic environment since 94. There's also been a bunch of changes to state law on how communities address housing, mobility, climate change, and environmental justice. And really, it's an opportunity to connect with the community and reaffirm our values and priorities. So in June, we did release a request for proposals and went through that process. The RFP was released mid-June. We did have a pre-proposal conference with uh, potential consultant teams on June 22nd. The deadline for submittals was July 21st. We did receive two submittals. We evaluated the proposals over two months this summer and conducted interviews with consultant teams August 17th. We did uh, create a, an evaluation panel made up of county staff representing numerous departments that will be involved with the update. And the panel recommended PlaceWorks and was selected on August 29th to assist with the significant project. And PlaceWorks has put together a consultant team consisting of BAE Urban Economics, ECOR Consulting, which will, will be helping with bi biological and also some of the CEQA work, Fear and Peers for Transportation and Mobility, and Weston Yost with Engineering and Water Management. So the scope of the general plan update is 13 inter interrelated tasks. Uh, the zoning ordinance update, which is task M, is optional. It would be done at the end of the zoning, or at the end of the general plan update to align our zoning ordinance with the new general plan. The budget for this undertaking is $3.5 million, and I will point out one of the key assumptions of this cost is um, we're looking at what we're doing with our existing community plans and how many become part of the general plan. So the assumption is five of our existing plans become sub-area plans, which are really appendices to the general plan. If there's a desire for more than five, the cost would be going up, but that is the assumption built into the $3.5 million figure. In the fiscal year, 2023-24 cost is a little over $660,000. So there is a, an aggressive schedule. We hope to get this done in about three and a half years, finishing up in 26, 27 fiscal year. And just go through some, our first steps, if the board allows us to proceed with this undertaking, we'll have a kickoff meeting. We are establishing a county working group made up of various departments. Uh, we'll be defining the planning area, so what areas become part of the general plan? Is there any future growth anticipated? Also looking at what the cities intend to do as far as growth goes. We'll prepare a public participation plan and come back to the board for approval of that. We'll also start looking at not only the existing general plan, but our existing community plans. Then we'll start working, uh, reaching out to the max, having public workshops and town halls. We'll be doing consultations with various groups throughout the county. Uh, there'll be some background data analysis, uh, real estate market analysis, background report collect, um, preparation and also data collection. So that'll be later this year, early 2024 for that work. And with that, I'm happy to recommend the board approve a contract with PlaceWorks Incorporated to assist with a comprehensive update of the 20, 2013 Placer County General Plan and preparation of an environmental impact report in the amount of $3,513,581 and authorize the county executive officer or designee to sign the contract and approve contract amendments in aggregate amount not to exceed $100,000, 
subject to risk, risk management and county council, con council concurrence. And secondly, approve a fiscal year 2023-24 budget amendment for planning services in the amount of $661,181 and cancel general fund capital reserves in the amount of $661,181. And lastly, to determine that the actions request, requested are not a project pursuant to CEQA guidelines 15378B5. And before I uh, answer any questions, I would like to introduce Joanna Jansen, uh, Managing Principal of PlaceWorks, if she'd like to say a few words with board concurrence. Good morning. Good morning, thank you so much for having me. As Chris said, I'm Joanna Jansen. I am a principal with PlaceWorks. We would be the lead consultant working on the general plan update and leading the team that Chris introduced. Uh, I have about 22 years of experience in the planning field. I've worked on close to two dozen general plan updates in that time, and I'm very excited about the opportunity to work with you uh, and your staff and the Pl Placer County community on this important general plan update. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Supervisor Landon. Um, I just had a question on the community engagement portion. So on the budget slide, it has 141,000 for community engagement. Does that include any costs associated with social media or any type of outreach at all under that piece? I just wanted to check on that. There, this includes the consultant work, but there's also going to be a substantial uh, you know, county effort. So PIO office, planning staff, and others doing outreach. So it's community events, um, town halls, workshops, mm -hmm. that type of thing. So this is just a dollar figure that the consultant team uh, will be utilizing. Okay. but there'll be significant outreach beyond that. Thank you. Supervisor Gore. Thank you. Actually, in regards to community outreach, um, if we have residents who have indicated their interest in participating, to whom should I forward their contact information? We do have a general plan update uh, website. It's pretty bare bones at this point, but there is a link there to sign up for our email list. Okay. So if the board does award the contract today, we'll start um, probably do a, an email uh, later this week just announcing that and then tell people how this is going to roll out over the next few months that would be great and if you could share that with us that way i can share it with people who have reached out to me i would appreciate Perfect. it thank you chris uh supervisor Gustafson. and while we're all on the same uh, uh beat here thinking about public engagement which is so critical to establishing the vision for the future and and so I think um, if there's any uh, chance to have a, a call for people to uh, get their emails into us, because some have expressed, but they're typically the people that are working with us already. And there's so many more that have an interest but may not know what the process will look like. And also, have we thought about surveys and, and undertaking some flash vote surveys or more detailed surveys just to garner that interest and get people thinking about it? Yeah, if I, if I may, uh, thank you, Supervisor. Uh, Chris Pahooli, uh, Planning Director. Um, we certainly have uh, been thinking about surveys. We have um, uh, included in the scope of work a, a survey to really kick off the general plan update process. That's something that we're working with PlaceWorks on. Uh, in addition to that, as, uh, as was noted, we will be bringing back a community engagement program for board consideration. Um, we previously included in the scope of work a, a general plan advisory committee or GPAC. That's something that we will uh, be contemplating and bringing back a recommendation as part of the uh, community engagement program and that will lay out ways in which um, community members can be involved perhaps in the, in the process. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Jones. <clears throat> Good morning, Chris. Good morning. So along the lines of that, the community outreach, um, you're going to reach out to all the MACs. I, I know that. You're going to have additional community meetings or just one or multiple? There will be check-ins throughout the process at okay. the MACs. And for those um, MAC areas that have a existing community plan that becomes a sub-area plan, mm -hmm. it'll be monthly, if not even bi-monthly meetings with the MAC and the public to prepare those sub-area plans. Okay. So we'll be heavily working with the MACs. Okay, okay. So if you're going to have an advisory committee, let's say, of constituents, right, how will 
will we each be able to participate with our constituents? Yeah, again, I think that that'll be something that needs to be fleshed out a little bit more okay. if, if the recommendation is indeed to do a, a GPAC. Um, at this point, we're, we're not certain. We want to work on that a little bit more and bring it back as part of a comprehensive community engagement program. Okay. So then will you send each of us information on, you know, just updates that we can all make sure we put in our newsletters? That's a great idea. That, yeah, because yeah. that way we each reach a number of our own constituents, and then we can also add uh, your contact information as well. Perfect. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. Can you uh, broaden the, my understanding of the sub-area plans? Are these for, like, Penryn and... Sheridan and the more rural areas? Yes, so we do have a number of existing community plans. And one of the things we're gonna be looking at is whether some of these are no longer needed, so they could, they could go away. There's some from 1968 to 54 years old. And not a lot of development in some of these sub-area plans, so maybe the best or most prudent thing to do is to combine them into the general plan area. For others, they're, they're fairly recent and have very specific implementation measures. Probably doesn't make a lot of sense to combine them into a general plan. And then there's those in-betweens that are maybe 20, 30 years old. Uh, development may either be built out or not much happening in these areas. May make sense to make them sub-area plans. So really, it'll be an appendix to the general plan. So. They don't lose their identity, they just become part of the general plan. And really the benefit to that is now you're on a routine update, so those sub-areas will be updated with the general plan update. Whereas today, we're updating two plans every decade, so with 13 plans, you're looking at every 80 years or so. So this is, there's a benefit to becoming a sub-area plan. But that'll be a board decision and a community decision, which areas become sub-area plans. Okay. Thank you, I just, uh, one, Yes, one last question. Um, have, I'm sure there's been considered the um, possibility of combining um, MACs, but I don't know whether the constituents would be willing to do that. Because now in my district, I have Granite Bay and the Horseshoe Bar Penryn, and they're all rural and un, um, unincorporated, so I don't know. I'm sure it would have to be a discussion with the MAC members of both MACs. Yeah, it would be. At this point, I think everything's on the table. Okay. <laughs> okay, seeing no more comments, questions from the board. Is there anyone in the audience wish to address the board on this item? Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Holmes, uh, board members, uh, Karen and Daniel. Uh, Wayne Nader, um, I was a little late this morning because I was... Uh, the process of filing, but a candidate beat me ahead of that, so it was, uh, took me a little bit longer, and yes, Cindy, it did go a little faster for me. Um, the question that I have is, from my time on the Planning Commission, we always had a real challenge in Granite Bay, just because it, uh, it was a little bit more loosely defined. With the, with the hope or the goal to work with the community to get something that's a little bit more specific in that area, so that as it goes through the planning process, it's a has a little bit more clear direction. I guess that's my question. Thank you. Any other comments from the audience? Anybody online? Okay. Can you address that? Yes. So in addition to the option of becoming a sub-area plan, there is an option to update existing community plans. So that could be a parallel effort. Um, we'll be working with the MAC uh, I think we already have a meeting scheduled with the, the MAC sub area update subcommittee coming up in the next couple of weeks. So it'll, we'll work with the community, we'll bring forward recommendations to the board, but ultimately it'll be a board decision of what happens with their existing community plans. Okay, thank you. Alrighty, seeing no more comments from, pub, from the public, um, the chair will entertain a motion. I'll second. It's moved by Supervisor Jones, second by Supervisor Gore. Gore. All those in favor, roll please. Roll call. Oh, roll call. Yeah. <laughs> Gore? Aye. Landon? Yes. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Holmes? Aye. The item is moved. Thank you, Chris.
So that it concludes our board items until one o'clock. So close session. Close session. Oh yeah, now we'll yeah we'll adjourn to close session. The board will now adjourn to close session to consider one item of existing litigation. As to the two items listed under anticipated litigation, both are dropped from the agenda.
Alrighty, time having arrived, we will return, just return from closed session and County Council will, re will report out. The board met in closed session to consider the following under existing litigation. Uh, Donna Hapai versus Placer County Animal Services. The board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. This concludes the report out of closed session. Thank you. <clears throat> now we'll move to our one o'clock timed item. This is agriculture, parks, and natural resources. This is a regional forest update. And uh, who is presenting is uh, Mr. Hunsinger and uh, Terry Trimmer. Yeah, good, good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. Josh Hunsinger, the Director of Agriculture, Parks, and Natural Resources. Uh, happy to uh, bring this item forward today uh, as an update on the progress we're making with the Forest Health Program. Uh, Carrie, unfortunately, is a little bit under the weather today, so uh, rather than explain you all to what she's going through uh, she's going to be uh, presenting online today okay. so she very much regrets not being here in person but I'll turn it over to Carrie okay thank you welcome Carrie thank you very much and I really appreciate your accommodation um, this is a bug that I, I think is best not shared <laughs> well, thank you <laughs> certainly um, so excuse me Carrie Timber your regional forest health coordinator here to give an update on the Regional Forest Health Program's activities over the past year and a preview of some of next year's anticipated work. Next slide, please. Uh, so more specifically today, we'll be reviewing various Regional Forest Health projects from this past year, uh, providing a quick update also on the Parks and Open Space Division's fire safe activities on county-owned properties diving into a little bit more detail on the Vibrant Planet Land Tender Project, um, which will actually be the, the main focus really of the presentation today. Uh, Vibrant Planet is the maker of the Land Tender Tool, which is an interactive mapping and planning tool that we're using to create a 10-year action plan for forest health activities throughout the county. And um, I'm hoping, because I can't see, but I'm desperately hoping that Joe Flannery, who's the Director of Customer Success for Vibrant Planet, is there in the chambers with you and he will be uh, walking us through actually a video that will show you um, the work that we've been able to conduct on that project so far. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so a brief background for anybody who might be new to the issue. Uh, your board, of course, has indicated that regional forest health is a top priority for a number of reasons. Not least of which is that much of the county has been uh, rated by Cal Fire as high or very high fire hazard. Along with that, Placer has the most habitable structures in these uh, high hazard wildland urban interface areas or WUI zones than any other county in California, um, a dubious honor uh, a, a bit. And then um, we also do, Placer County also does have critical infrastructure and many other resources that both uh, people within the county and beyond uh, rely on, including things like water and energy, recreation, interstate travel, and so much more. So we need all the tools in the toolbox uh, in order to protect people's lives, property, resources, and our critical infrastructure. Next slide, please. Your board has also provided guidance for us over time uh, regard regarding your particular priorities around evaluating every acre of fire prone land in the county and implementing landscape level forest treatment uh, uh, projects to reduce that wildfire risk. Also, increasing the use of uh, biomass utilization as a means of disposing of the excess forest and residential green waste material that, that comes off of these projects as a means of reducing fuel loads and fire risk. Also, uh, advocating on legislative and regulatory issues that affect our ability to do this important work. And then finally, aligning with partners and strategies to support cross-jurisdictional projects that can benefit the county. Next slide, please. So we just want to start uh, with a few illustrations of work that the Regional Forest Health and Parks and Open Space Divisions have been doing in response to this guidance from your board. So I'm going to start out by highlighting seven projects that we've been working on. And then with Joe's help, uh, we'll dive in a little bit deeper into the eighth project, which is the Land Tender Project. So the first one, of course, is French Meadows, which I know you guys are very familiar with. Um, but I just wanted to give you a brief update on where we are as we reach um, the as we near the end of our work season. So this year we've been able to uh, conduct treatments on 826 acres and actually depending on how the weather goes the rest of this week 
uh, we may be able to break that thousand, make, th thousand acre mark, which would make me very happy. Um, we will have spent close to a million dollars on hand thinning, mastication, and work in preparation for prescribed burning. That's just for this season. And then cumulatively speaking, we have about 7,200 acres total of planned treatments. We've completed about 4,300 acres to date, meaning we're roughly 60% complete for the entire project. Funding-wise, we've secured 17 million in funding and so far have spent 10.6 million plus the roughly million dollars that we anticipate receiving in invoices for the work to be completed this season. Unfortunately, as we've talked about before, this project has faced a number of ongoing challenges which continue to um, keep us busy. Uh, we've had a fairly small pool of vendors servicing this project and for the for this season and the past probably two seasons really, uh, they've been devoting more of their time and resources to the time sensitive salvage efforts coming off of the major mega fires that we've had recently, including the Caldor, the Dixie, and of course last year's Mosquito Fire. And so uh, they've been devoting their expertise and their equipment to dealing with the the salvage and fire uh, rather than fire mitigation projects like French Meadows. So that has definitely affected uh, their ability to to conduct work on our project. We also this season had a very late start because of the severe winter last year. So that meant that some of our vendors were starting their work on lower elevation projects and then couldn't move their crews and equipment as quickly as or as early as they might have been able to um, weather wise. So that's another issue that we're dealing with. Um, the closure of Mosquito Ridge Road resulting from the Mosquito Fire and then the severe winter, that's our major ingress and egress route to the project and so having to go way around through the El Dorado National Forest in order to get to French Meadows Reservoir added a great deal of travel time and then, you know, obviously reduced then the amount of work time in any given day so that factored into our vendors decisions about whether or not they could send crews out. And then finally, <laughs> excuse me, uh, lack of certain types of trained workers. Uh, and interestingly, the, the hardest hit seems to be the truck drivers, the, the haulers that haul the logs and the biomass material in and out. So there's just not enough of those drivers who are trained to deal with the conditions in the backcountry. Um, and so that also has hampered uh, the ability to get as much work done as we would have liked. But we are, we are doing things to address these challenges. So as it relates to the vendor situation, we have a current procurement active on the street right now for the remaining two seasons worth of work for French Meadows. And we did um, a great deal of outreach to generate more interest and engagement. And so we have 24 vendors who registered as part of this bid process. And of those 14 showed up for an in-person uh, bid walk out on the project so they could get a better sense of what they were, uh, what they were bidding on. So we're cautiously optimistic that for these next two seasons, we'll have, first of all, more bidders to choose from in terms of awarding contracts. And then secondly, just, you know, more people available to help help us get the work done. And as it relates to Mosquito Ridge Road, we've been in close contact with the Forest Service, of course, pretty much on a weekly basis, really. Uh, and it appears that work for, um, for the permanent fix on Mosquito Ridge Road is starting today. Uh, and so we're hoping that, again, weather permitting, that that work can be completed and that the road will be open and available to us in, at the start of the next season, which will make a great, a big difference. Um, we ended up in our procurement having to ask our vendors to give us basically two different bids, one if they're coming in by Mosquito Ridge and one if they're coming in through the El Dorado. Um, and in terms of what we're doing next on French Meadows, we're going to continue working with our uh, prescribed burn uh, partners, which is primarily the Nature Conservancy and the Forest Service to help them prepare areas for future prescribed burning. We don't manage the burning ourselves, but we do do some of the groundwork that prepares for that activity. We'll be executing contracts this winter coming out of our procurement that we just talked about um, to be sure that all the remaining work is contracted out and that gives the contractors the ability to plan more effectively for their uh, the movement of their equipment and personnel. So we think that will help um, ensure that we have more vendors working on our project next season. And then as it relates to the training, we've recently connected with Sierra College and the Golden Sierra Workforce Board. 
excuse me, both of whom have uh, expressed interest in helping, helping us explore ways to address the, the forestry workforce needs, whether it's through additional training programs or augmenting existing programs. So we're looking forward to having those uh, further conversations. Um, so that's the wrap up on French Meadows. If you could advance, please, to the next slide. Thank you. Our, um, our second um, big project is mosquito fire restoration. So we've been working with the Tahoe National Forest to prepare for restoration and reforestation activities on some of the federal lands that were burned by last year's mosquito fire. And I just want to point out, this one's a really interesting project because it illustrates the benefit of the counties having a master stewardship agreement with the U.S. Forest Service, in this case, the Tahoe, um, because it, it, in certain cases, it allows us, the county, to be able to move more quickly and, of course, salvage operations on fire that are, has already burned is, is really important to the county, too, because much of the work is uh, removing dead trees, burned trees, for public safety uh, purposes. So it is a project that is important to the county, and we were able to help facilitate and expedite uh, the movement of that project forward. So that's another of the benefits of the Master Stewardship Agreement, which I think we initially had primarily to support the French Meadows project, but now we're starting to see that there are other benefits too as additional project needs come up and the county is situated such that, that we can help the Forest Service move things along more quickly. Excuse me. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, great. Then another project that we've been working on, <clears throat> working on up on the Forest Hill Divide has, has gone by various names. It started out being called Baker Ranch and then it's Short Tail Canyon. And now internally we kind of refer to it as the Forest Hill uh, Community Protection Project. But all of that to say we're working to create um, a new coalition of local, state and federal partners who can plan for a series of fuel breaks and other activities to protect communities on the divide that were not affected by mosquito fire and of course uh, protection against future fires. Um, we do have a federal earmark for this project in the, in the current federal budget, thanks to our Senator Alex Padilla. Uh, budget negotiations are ongoing as you I'm sure are aware and it's, a, it's not a done deal to, so to speak, but we're feeling pretty comfortable and confident that um, that we will receive that funding to help us get this project off the ground. We are also uh, working with the Sierra Nevada Conservancy on potential capacity building support from them to help also get this kind of new collaborative project off the ground. They're very interested, the Conservancy is very interested in supporting these larger landscape, um, larger coalitions to, to do this kind of work at a, at a grander scale. And so they're looking around through, throughout the region to identify places where there's capacity existing that can um, be leveraged into the creation of these larger collaborative groups and they're interested in, in talking with us about that. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, if that's the case, we might look at expanding this um, Forest Hill Divide effort to take on a larger landscape across the entire American River watershed. So that would kind of put us on par with a, a similar project in the North Yuba watershed, which has been chosen by the Forest Service as a, um, a priority landscape and therefore attracts literally tens and hundreds of millions of dollars of federal funding because they have achieved that particular designation. So ultimately, that's what that's what we're working toward is developing something of that uh, same nature here in Placer County so that we can start attracting some of that same level of funding in the future. Uh, next slide, please. We're also working on a fuel reduction project with any other partners. We're, we're really a, a sort of a side partner to this one, but it's an important project along Interstate 80 um, that OES, our, our own Office of Emergency Services, is leading with many other uh, partners, including Caltrans, the state, uh, Cal Fire, local fire safe councils in that area, Placer RCD, and others to, um, to reduce fuel along a 30 mile stretch of Interstate 80. And the goal there is to protect communities and infrastructure that fi from fires that can be started by you know truck breaks catching fire or unfortunately accidents that can occur on those stretches of Interstate 80. And of course, you know fire can easily then skip off into the uh, into the forested areas along this, the edge of the freeway and then get into our communities and important assets and resources. So that's another uh, rather important project because I, I, I meant to 
count uh, before this presentation how many of these truck brake fires there have been. Um, and I know there have been multiples so far this year, but you know we hear about them every year. Next project, next uh, slide, please. Another area of project work for us is helping to support uh, advocacy tours, typically of the French Meadows area. Um, we work with our partners to organize these field tours to bring out decision makers and their staff at the local, state, and federal levels to showcase the benefits and, frankly, sometimes the challenges of uh, doing this wildfire resilience and forest health work in the field. And it's been it's been pretty successful, I think, in terms of generating interest from our elected officials and uh, you know prompting them to help us increase financial and policy support for this important work at, at all of the different decision-making levels. <coughs> Next slide, please. <coughs> Uh, the sixth project is the California Forest Residual Aggregation and Market Enhancement, or CalFrame, project. And simply put, this is uh, Placer County is working with the Placer County Water Agency on a study that funded by the Office of Planning and Research at the state to look at opportunities for better connecting projects that generate biomass material, like French Meadows, as an example, or any of these other fuel reduction projects that we've been talking about, to connect the material from those projects to facilities or other entities that can make use of it for feedstock to create energy or, or various other value-added products. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, for this one, I wanted to give a shout out to my colleagues in the Parks and Open Space Division. As you know, they've recently come under the umbrella of the Ag Department. And we're discovering as we get to know each other that there's a lot of synergies and, and opportunities for us to work together. So they've identified over 400 county-owned properties and evaluated all of those for defensible space and other kind of treatment needs. And starting in fiscal year 21-22, they identified about 140 parcels, uh, close to 800 acres in need of treatment. So this is, you know, the county kind of putting its money where its mouth is when we're asking other people to uh, to do defensible space around their properties, we need to be sure we're doing the same on our own. So over the last two years, Parks and Open Space has treated nearly 200 acres, and they've also been able to purchase some equipment to help with ongoing maintenance. Um, in addition to the funding that was authorized for this project by your board, uh, Parks and Open Space received an award from the California Tahoe Conservancy in the amount of $658,000 and change. Uh, to do treatment on 71 acres specifically in the Tahoe Basin. So Parks is currently working on the first 17 of those acres and hopes to complete those before the winter weather sets in, and then they'll, they'll work on the rest in subsequent seasons. Um, Parks is also in the process of securing vendors to work on a 50-acre fuel load reduction project at Hidden Falls. And um, this would be to reestablish and expand fire breaks that were created originally when the park opened. And then Parks has also completed four other uh, fuel reduction projects totaling about 50 acres, and that included removal of dead trees in, in the Lake Tahoe area, um, work on Los Lagos Parkway, Old Dutch Flat Cemetery, and Dry Creek Corridor. Um, also, an interesting tool that Parks and Open Space uses that I'd like to explore for the, the forestry world is grazing. So that's a big part of their land and vegetation management and fuel reduction strategy. So they had uh, sheep and goat grazing contracts this year, totaling about $231,000 and covering just shy of 580 acres throughout throughout the county. So that's at a cost of about $400 an acre, which is far less than the, the mechanical version of that kind of treatment. Um, so that's something that I look forward to looking into. And then finally, uh, we've identified just like last week, practically, a, um, a project that we're going to work on together, Forest Health and Parks Parks and Open Space, um, along with our environmental engineering folks, to develop a fuels treatment project on 144 acres of, of the county-owned property surrounding Cabin Creek and the Eastern Regional Landfill. And this will be a great complement to um, work that's being done by the Forest Service to treat the, the land, the Forest Service land that surrounds the project. So that's like the outer ring, and then we would be able to uh, if we can pull this project off, we'd be able to um, arrange for treating the county-owned portion outside of the buildings and, and infrastructure. So that's an exciting new project that we're undertaking. Okay, next slide, please. All right, this brings us to land tender. Um, 
So this is, I think, our biggest project this year, which is the development of this interactive mapping and decision support tool to help the county, first of all, identify critical assets that need protection. Secondly, evaluate those assets um, related to the, the wildfire risk that could affect them. And then third, use that information to create a 10-year action plan and sort of project pipeline of uh, projects that we can do to minimize or reduce the, the fire risk to those critical assets. So we have a video that we're going to share in just a minute that will illustrate our progress to date and sort of explain a little bit more about how this land tender tool actually works. Uh, but before we get into that, I just wanted to address a couple of questions that have come up uh, as we've been talking about this process. Um, questions related to how the use of land tender, you know, at the sort of countywide level might affect the priorities of individual property owner groups or other organizations. So I just want to say that the intent of the land tender uh, process is not to take the place of localized planning and project identification. There's already great work being done by private landowners and other groups, our fire safe councils, our firewise communities, um, CAL FIRE, the RCDs, and so many more. Um, you know, they're doing great work to protect homes and communities. The land tender process is is a little bit different. So in addition to these localized plans, the county needs an overall countywide plan that addresses broader county goals and priorities. And in this case, also that would include the larger landscape uh, forest health work, much of which we do in partnership with federal partners. So we need this countywide plan in order to be eligible for certain state and federal grants for large landscape work. Um, you know, meaning that we're planning for projects in the hundreds of thousands of acres range as opposed to hundreds or thousands, which is, you know, kind of where some of these uh, more community focused efforts land. So um, county staff is still here to help work with and support any of these individual fire safe councils or other organizations in achieving their specific goals. And in fact, we can use the land tender tool at those smaller geographic scales to work with these individual organizations and help them to develop their own uh, planning and prioritizing for their communities and their particular footprint. So they're two separate processes that work together, but, but achieve slightly different goals. Um, okay, one more slide, please, before we go to the video. Sorry if that was confusing. Uh, there should be a list back one for, yes, perfect. Thank you very much. So what we want to do now is pick up where we left off at our update in March and share some uh, preliminary analysis from the use of the land tender tool. We've only had our full county data, Placer County data available for just a couple of weeks, um, but we have been able with Joe's help to pull together a sample of how this process works using our uh, uh, specified data. So the county has been working with a coordinating committee that we call the Wildfire and Forest Resilience Committee, or WFRC for short. And this is an internal group that's made up of county departments and close partners that engage in wildfire and forest health issues. I just wanted to bring this up and show you the list of participants because you're going to hear a lot about this WFRC committee. Um, they're going to be re referred to quite a bit in the video that, that we're going to show in just a second. They have been kind of serving as a steering committee guiding the implementation of land tender for the county and they're going to be continuing to work with us to oversee the deployment and the results and so you'll see on the slide that this is you know a pretty wide-ranging multi-disciplinary team including leadership from various entities and departments here at the county such as cal fire the plaster fire department plaster fire marshal Office of Emergency Services. We've had representatives from the CEO's office in both Auburn and North Lake Tahoe, um, and then Air Pollution Control, Placer County Water Agency, Placer and Placer RCD. So um, this is our kind of team of experts uh, who've been helping us out with the project. So, um, okay, so we're gonna show a video now um, that Joe Flannery from Vibrant Planet made. Um, he's going to walk us through what's happened since our last update, share some of the initial analysis conducted by this WFRC group, and set the stage for how this initial assessment can be used with stakeholders and other partners to great, gain consensus going forward on what the, the priority areas are to work in the county. <clears throat> um, after the video, we'll circle back. I've got just two, two more quick slides to wrap up the overall presentation, and you know then we, we can open it up for comments and questions. Um, 
So I think I think we should get to the video. All right. If you would. Hey, Carrie. Yes. There was no link provided for the video. Is there a way that we could share a screen share or is there someone that has it that we could? Yes. Um, just in case this happened, we had Patty Armenteros ready to go. I gave her the bridge. I don't know if you need to make her a presenter or not, but she is, she would have it on her screen and be able to share. Perfect. We just requested her to promote. So awesome. One second. Thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. I'm glad we were able to make it work. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. This is Patty. Okay, uh, let me share my screen so we can get presenting. One moment, please. And let me move the movie over. Okay, can you see that? Um, I'm so sorry. One moment. Okay, what about now? Let's take a quick pause. The, apparently, Josh, your staff just sent it over to the guys in the back, so they're going to see if they can load it through our system. So give them just a moment. Megan, would it make sense for me to go through the final two programmatic slides while we're lining this up, and then we can just wrap up with land tender altogether? I, whatever you would like to do, That's Carrie. Fine. Okay. Um, okay, and we don't really need slides for this, so I can just uh, walk you through what are what we have as the next steps for the overall regional forest health program uh, next year, which includes. I realize I should have my camera on here. Uh, continuing to manage implementation of French Meadows and and the other exciting projects that we that we discussed a moment ago, uh, supporting our legislative affairs staff to advocate on issues affecting our work. Um, those are usually either policy things that affect us, for example, um, the recent passage of the prevailing wage law that is going to now apply prevailing wage to uh, many of the kinds of jobs that, that we have here in the woods to do this fuel reduction work. So we're going to be working with um, our, our advocates and our partners to try to figure out what that means for us and to get clear on the definitions and how much that will affect our work going forward. Um, continuing to explore opportunities to expand biomass utilization. We're doing quite a bit of work in that area right now, growing out of that CalFrame project that we mentioned, plus um, other actual 
efforts to site facilities like our own environmental engineering team that's working on the Cavan Creek project uh, up at the Eastern Regional Landfill. And then, of course, finishing up the development and approval and then implementation of this 10 year action plan um, and building out that project pipeline so that we can start working with in coalition with partners to seek the necessary funding and get some of these projects off the ground. And then um, finally, I just wanted to uh, I just wanted to point out that our, our own Andy Fecco, uh, general manager of Placer County Water Agency, he was appointed to a Forest Service Wildland Fire Mitigation and Management Commission. Uh, the commission's goal was to identify and recommend actions to help increase the pace and scale of forest treatment work across the U.S. I mean, this is the whole country. And according to Andy, uh, well, first of all, the report from that commission's efforts just came out at the end of September. It's a massive report. It's like 320 pages or something. Um, but Andy was clear that out of the 148 recommendations in that commission report, the biggest takeaway for him, at least, is this need to work in partnership to increase the pace and scale of, of all of this kind of work. And that's really what we see the Regional Forest Health Program and particularly our 10 year action plan. That's that's what we feel that's designed to do is to help Placer County, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, identify and start building these partnerships and coalitions and collaborative efforts to, you know, to do all, as we mentioned earlier, all the tools in the toolbox for home hardening, for neighborhood and community defensible space, for uh, reducing excess fuels across our forested landscapes. Um, if we do all those things together, we can build community resilience and reduce the severity and impact of wildfires on um, our, our lives, property, and, and the resources in Placer County. So that's that's where we end up. And now, if we can, uh, if it's appropriate, to backtrack to the tool that's helping us to achieve that end, um, I will stop talking. <laughs> we still need a couple minutes. We're still we've got a couple minutes, uh, Gary. But uh, thank you for your presentation. Looks like you've been doing a lot of work, and we appreciate it, making some kind of good progress. Uh, Supervisor Gustafson. Is it okay if we ask some questions while we're you spending betcha. time? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, Carrie, on, uh, I know we're going to see the presentation on land tender, but I wanted to ask whether we have coordinated with PG&E and Liberty Utilities on their undergrounding projects so that the high threat areas may not be as high threat if the utilities in a certain area are undergrounded we might focus our energy on another area where they haven't undergrounded or vice versa so i was just wondering if that's part of land tenders mapping to look at those utility projects that's a great question. I may kick it, kick it in more detail to Joe. Um, PG&E has been using land tender as well, and so they have been, uh, you know, making their data available through land tender to Vibrant Planet. I don't know if that data though contains the undergrounding, uh, but that's that's a great heads up that we should be asking about that. And their projects are on pause, I think, while they're waiting for the utility, uh, the PUC, to approve their rate increases. But um, both Liberty, Liberty um, Utilities in the Tahoe, Truckee area, as well as that. The other thing I've been asked a lot about from the smaller communities, and maybe I'll go to a question you can answer right now, which is on the um, I-80 corridor. I had a request from some folks uh, from Emigant Grap up to Cisco Grove. And I'm wondering if we could get the map of what Caltrans is going to work on along that highway stretch because there are, well, Dutch Flat, Alta is where we've seen the most truck fires. We have seen incidents further up the hill. And I'm just not sure the extent of where those boundaries go for that um, Caltrans work. So I don't know if you have that map or if there's others. Or if Dave has information <laughs> on that, because it's a Thank great you. project. We've finally got Caltrans to the table, and my staff have been going to all kinds of meetings, pushing them to get their highway done. But as I get to drive it every day, I see how thick it is on both sides. Uh, indeed, um, uh, Cindy, members of the board. So uh, the the project, at least that's on the table right now, is more the, the Alta, the Dutch Flat. You mm -hmm. think about where the... The, the Dutch fire was right in the middle of the Mosquito Fire, things like that. 
Uh, essentially, the way that the, the committee has been uh, trying to approach this is in sort of in pieces and phases. So phase one was this piece, high priority on the west side of the freeway, knowing that Caltrans is doing a project on the east side of the freeway. And so one of the recommendations that came out of the committee was to kind of you know keep that out of the mix while Caltrans does that. But understanding that really uh, that work needs to be done from, you know, from Auburn, you know, all really the all the way to the state line. Um, and of course, just as, as Carrie has mentioned, uh, you know, there's a lot of, of those coordination issues, state and the federal have to get together. You know, the county's in great position with, with U.S. Forcers because we had that stewardship agreement with Tahoe. Caltrans, as I understand it, uh, doesn't necessarily have those same type of agreements. Uh, Cal Fire is in that mix too, trying to help everybody kind of work through that. So definitely I'm kind of on our radar for that, that whole stretch, like I said, from, from here really all the way to the state line. But this, at least the initial project that Carrie mentioned, is really kind of that, that Alta Dutch flat on the west side as so that first phase. So continued advocacy on our part to push it throughout. A hundred percent, right? And, and uh, you know, I-80, of course, is the, you know, obviously the, the 800 pound gorilla in the room, but there are so many other Caltrans roads in our in our county in that that we need to be looking at, um, and of course, as well as more of our own. Well, and that's where hopefully we we understand where the threats are and we focus on those areas first. So right. that that group I just met with last week and they had asked about that. So yep, absolutely, Thank you. absolutely on our radar. And I guess I would just say, um, and not to steal Carrie's thunder, but you know there will be some public input opportunities as part of this, and we would strongly encourage folks as they're, you know. Pre one, come and participate, please. And whether it's in the land tender or in the community wildfire protection plan work that we have coming up very soon, all of those, we really want the, the community's input on those things uh, to make sure that they, they stay on the radar and stay you know, high on the list. Thank you. Oh, I, I may have other questions, but I think you're probably ready for a land tender ready? Now. Yeah. Okay. okay, well, let's roll it. Hi, I'm Joe Flannery, Vibrant Planet's Director of Customer Success and your guide inside the Land Tender platform. We actually have two updates to provide today in regards to Land Tender and Placer County. The first update is that Land Tender is now available across the majority of the forested portions of Placer County. We're inside Land Tender now, looking at the Placer County custom version delineated by the yellow boundary. It's actually too big for one screen, but I can scroll, scroll across and see that from Auburn State Recreation Area all the way to the shores of Lake Tahoe, land tender is now readily available to assess the landscape, mitigate risk, and prioritize projects. The second update is that the WFRC group has already been busy in land tender with a preliminary assessment of the county and some preliminary prioritization of potential projects. They're in a position to begin stakeholder outreach and consensus building at this time. As a review, the WFRC has divided the county into three zones based on the National Weather Service fire weather zones. Those different zones are from east to west, the Tahoe zone, the summit zone, In the foothill zone. Let's look at one of these zones in detail and explain how the WFRC is weighting trade-offs to prioritize projects right now. We are now inside of the foothill zone. We see Auburn State Recreation Area and Interstate 80 running through the northern portion of this zone. As a reminder, we can assess trade-offs of limited resources to projects by using our objective sliders on the left-hand side. Again, a reminder from our last video, we see that the categories of sliders match the categories of strategic areas, resources, and assets. Now, I've already weighed the objectives within the WUI area, and the WFRC group has chosen to prioritize trade-offs and weigh trade-offs of resource allocation within WUI areas, and then weigh them differently outside of WUI areas. For the sake of time, 
I've already expressed the WFRC's weight objectives within the WUI areas, but I'll walk you through how the WFRC weighted objectives outside in the remaining portion of the zone. As a group, the WFRC has assigned trade-offs and resource allocations of assets in this zone to a four, safety to a five, recreation to a four, biodiversity to a three, ecological commodity to a three, carbon to a three, water to a four, and science and culture to a three. Two things of note. The first is we just saw a lot of color changing on the screen. If you recall, what has just happened is land tender is now expressing the areas that have the highest restorative return on investment. Essentially, they're the best bang for our buck of where we can mitigate the loss in the order of magnitude described by the weighted objectives on the left-hand side. We know that there are limited resources to treat every square inch within Placer County, and planners have a difficult decision to make of where to weigh trade-offs. This is why we've built the slider objectives on the left-hand side. When the WFRC group has weighted safety all the way to a five, the maximum, they're essentially saying that they want to allocate resources to safety to the fullest extent, but maybe one extent less when it comes to recreation. It's not that they care about recreation less. It's just the WFRC group knows that there are limited resources available to treat and mitigate risk. And they've expressed these trade-offs accordingly by weighing their objectives. We also know that these areas in blue are far too great for us to treat all at once. And if I scroll down, I see there's over 120,000 acres. That might not be feasible to treat at this time. For a preliminary assessment, the WFRC group has chosen to look at 2,000 acre projects over the course of 10 years. I think this is actually a, a pretty good goal here. Remember, there are two other zones in Placer County. And if we te treat 2,000 acres in each zone, that's about 6,000 acres a year over 10 years. I'm now gonna hit create scenario. Right now, land tender is optimizing all of the weighed trade-offs along with the project constraints to give us our initial projects within this area. As a reminder, I can click on some of these projects. I can actually scroll down. I can see the distribution of likely treatments that are gonna mitigate the risk to the things we care about. I can see the costs, and I can see the land ownership distribution. A quick note on the patterning of projects within this area. If I turn on my fire hazard model, I can see that a lot of my projects are aligned in the areas with the higher fire hazard. I see some projects down here around Todd Valley with high fire hazard. I also see some projects down along the Auburn State Recreation Area. One thing that I like to see is I turned on my safety zone, and here we can see a critical evacuation route running right through all of these three projects. And as we know, we weighted safety very high. It's no mistake that there's a critical evacuation route for the communities of Todd Valley that runs right through prioritized projects. That wasn't the only factor. As we saw, the WFRC group decided to weigh objectives in a whole slew of different options. Let's actually go through the other zones and take a quick glance at how the projects with the same constraints of 2,000 acres over 10 years with a project a year looks across the rest of the county. Here we see the summit zone. We see projects near the crest where there's high recreational values. And we also see projects aligning around the Interstate 80 corridor and some of our wooey areas as well. Let's take a look at the Tahoe zone. Utilizing a slightly different set of weighted objectives because the WFRC had the choice to weigh objectives and assess trade-offs differently for each zone. 
And the Tahoe zone, the Summit zone, and the Foothill zone all had custom assesses, assessments of trade-offs. One thing of note within the Tahoe zone is I do see a lot of projects aligning around ski areas. Now this is no mistake, as in this zone, the WFRC group chose to weight the recreation objective very high. They're assessing the trade-off of recreation in this area and allocating resources towards protecting those precious assets. As a longtime recreationalist myself in Placer County, I understand that many of the recreational assets within Placer County are clustered unevenly within this Tahoe zone. And ski areas in particular have a lot of overlap of existing recreational opportunities. Thus, we do see projects around the ski areas. What's neat about land tender is it gives us the opportunity to quickly iterate and experiment and reassess. For example, let's say I wanna take a look at where the projects may lie if I were to exclude the ski areas from prioritization. It only takes a moment, and this is what it looks like. I've actually built distinct management areas that exclude the ski areas, and now we see a lot more projects clustered around Marta's Camp, Lahontan, and the northern portion of Highway 89 within the Tahoe zone. Again, I'm not suggesting we ignore the ski areas. As a skier myself, I think the skiing opportunity would be improved along with the reduction of risk to our recreation infrastructure by doing so. I just want to demonstrate here that land tender affords us the opportunity to look beyond their initial prioritization at a second tier of prioritizations, if you will. Let's go back to the main Tahoe area that we looked at in the beginning, where the ski areas are included for assessment. As I mentioned earlier, the WFRC has simply conducted here a preliminary assessment and a preliminary project prioritization. This really sets the stage for multiple further iterations engaging stakeholders and collaborators. Let's look at a quick example now. Let's say hypothetically a group in this zone were to only weigh safety and assets, ignoring this assessment of trade-offs to all other strategic areas, resources, and assets. In a assets and safety only scenario, we see the projects really clustered around the airport, Martis Camp, Highway 89, and just south of Donner State Memorial Park. In the future, we can actually start to engage stakeholders by using our Create Comparison screen. Let's compare the initial WFRC scenario with this assets and safety scenario. I'll hit compare. And as I scroll down, we can start to see areas of non-consensus and complete consensus. We're now looking at the same comparison screen on a slightly larger view. I'm gonna start by turning off the areas of non-consensus and focusing only on these areas of green, complete consensus. These areas in dark green are showing prioritized projects that satisfy the needs of both of the aforementioned scenarios. The first, of course, a WFRC scenario that assess trade-offs to a whole host of strategic areas, resources, and assets, overlaid with the hypothetical stakeholder scenario that only allocated resources to the protection of safety and assets. As we can see, Land Tenor affords us the opportunity to build consensus and to iterate with stakeholders and community members very quickly. When taken at scale across all three zones, the WFRC scenarios can form a beginning, a foundation, or a starting place to engage stakeholders and community members as we all work together to prioritize projects to reduce the risk across Placer County. Great, so <clears throat> I just wanted to quickly outline uh, what our next steps are anticipated for land tender and would then love to open up to questions and 
uh, if it's appropriate to have Joe at a microphone, if there's anything specific to the land tender tool, uh, he would be the person to be answering those questions for us. So quickly, um, our next steps are you know pretty much what Joe was suggesting. We have a sort of a baseline scenario that was created by the WFRC group that represents you know many of the most of if not all of really the the county's primary fire and forestry related partners um, through our various departments. So what we are planning on doing then is to further the conversation by hosting uh, town hall meetings in each of the three zones that were described in the video, the Tahoe zone, the summit zone, and the foothill zone. And the purpose of those town hall meetings will be to, um, to allow the public to better understand how this tool works, the public and of course any or organizations that are interested in, in operating in that area. And then through a survey tool, uh, once we're able to explain how it works and how the weighting of the different objectives can change the uh, focus areas on the map, uh, we'll be asking participants to fill out a, a quick survey that we can then merge and come up with uh, sort of public scenarios, if you will, by zone uh, based on the input from, from those town hall meetings and the survey responses. And then as Joe described in the video, we can start overlaying these different scenarios that are, were developed by different people with different sets of uh, priorities, but then we start highlighting those areas of consensus. And that's not to say that we wouldn't do work outside of those areas, but, you know, in terms of having a countywide plan that we can put forward to um, our federal partners and federal and state funding agencies uh, to have done that level of analysis to be able to show those, those areas of complete consensus, regardless of the stakeholder group who was uh, inputting their priority, is a really, really powerful tool. And you know, again, it's, we, we would love to do everything. <laughs> we would love to treat all 120,000 acres uh, and then beyond, but we, we, need to, we need to stage the effort and stage the work and raise the money to do those projects kind of in, in some sort of sequence. And, and the tool also allows us to be opportunistic. If there's a particular funding source uh, looking to fund activities of a certain type or in a certain geographic location, we've, you know, we have our analysis already completed and can just pull a project out of that region or, or that kind of activity and have it ready to go as a, as a grant application and we can work with our individual partners within the county to do the same thing. So uh, it seems like a, a really powerful tool that gives us a lot of um, de decision support to justify what we choose to do. Uh, so once we are able to, to hold these town hall meetings, to meet with fire safe councils and some of our key partners ind individually, and create these different scenarios that we can layer and then get our consensus focus areas, then we will be bringing that plan back to your board for review and approval. And then that will launch our organized efforts uh, to our collaborative efforts to get those, those projects off the ground. So with that, I'm wondering if there's any questions that we can answer or thoughts that you might have or direction that, that you would like us to be aware of as we go forward into this next sort of more public phase. <clears throat> Thank you, Carrie. Supervisor Gustin has another minute. Question, comment? Thank you. Um, thanks, Carrie. And uh, remind me, are we still, are we the first county to do this on a countywide basis in the state? So I believe I, that's true using this tool. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I think we all need to be proud of the investments we've made to try to protect our communities by doing this. Um, I had a, a technical question first. Um, how do you define assets? What's in that category? Um, assets are essentially our built environment um, that is not related to safety. Safety would be um, communication safety, infrastructure, yeah. um, critical evacuation routes. So homes, homes, hospitals, uh, schools. Hospitals, schools. In fact, Placer County has several versions of what a structure is. So a structure will respond to fire uh, very similar, right? However, the societal value of that structure could be valued differently. Right. So Placer County has critical infrastructure. There's hospitals, there's primary structures, et cetera. Um, roads, 
water utility infrastructure, utility infrastructure in particular. And in fact, to answer your, your question from earlier as well, the example I showed with the, the ski areas, how I turn them on, turn them back off, and we had two different priorities. We could easily do the same thing with uh, pg and &E utilities and Liberty utilities. Mm -hmm. We could have one version where they'd be above ground. What are the priority projects in that area? Another version, we can exclude them for a hypothetical situation in which they're undergrounded. And we could sequence and prioritize. There's still a there. danger. I don't 100%. deny that, but the risk goes down once the utilities are underground. Absolutely. I think so, if we look at our catastrophic. Exactly. Properties. Exactly. Did I answer your question about yep. the assets? Yeah, I, and I think you know, um, while I love our outdoor recreation, I think if you ask any homeowner paying insurance right now, protecting their homes and assets uh, is more important than even the industries that supply us with skiing. So, you know, I, I, I think that's, you know, where my <laughs> focus is, although certainly I appreciate the skiing as well. Um, so I, I, so in your waiting system, at least in the Foothills area, you equalized recreation to assets. And so that is why I asked what's in assets, because yeah. to me, that would be a higher priority than the recreation. You, you put safety as five, you put assets as four, and you put recreation as four, and I might. But again, the, I'm sure that you all had a great opportunity to talk about that and weigh it appropriately. I think our constituents would say recreation isn't as important as our homes. Yeah, and one point of clarification. So there's not, there wasn't enough time in the video. It was already yeah. long enough as it was. There was two zones for prioritization within that foothill zone, okay. a wooey zone, where all of the primary homeowners are, and I'd already weighed those. Okay. So I was expressing quickly the WFRC's weighted okay. objectives outside of communities. Outside of the So there's a, probably okay. a few structures out there. That's why assets was the WFRC group probably chose assets as a four. I'll tell you inside of the WUI area, it was much higher than recreation. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. That I just wanted to hear that. Great. Thank you. All right. And then um, I think my, my only other comment is, and, and I just happened to be listening to NPR early this morning, and um, they were interviewing somebody, and I forgot her, uh, her position, but she was basically saying, you know, five to six years is what we get out of a project, and then we've got to retreat because the risk starts going up again. So when we look at a 10-year horizon, but within five or six years, we've got to retreat the existing areas. We we need to accelerate the pace and scale that we're, that we're and and I know this tool will help us get there and make that argument. Um, and then a question for um, or a comment and then a question on uh, the the firewise communities. Many of the firewise communities in my districts have organized HOAs. They have a staff, a newsletter an ability to get people engaged in a conversation. It's the more rural areas that don't have an HOA driving it that are still risky and have need, and that's where I think the county's leadership steps up with the maps and through the town halls. We need to engage those folks because they may be living in a higher risk area, but they don't have an HOA with a newsletter and a way to contact all their neighbors easily to get them to a meeting to start working on a project. And I've heard that from repeatedly from various uh, members. It's like, how do I get involved? How do I get my neighbors involved? Will you help me get my neighbors involved? They want to do the work, but they don't have that HOA to kind of facilitate those discussions. So they rely on the, the county's leadership to do that. And so then my um, final question is, how can we use this to get some of the CAL FIRE new grant money? <laughs> And I assume that's our intent, is to put a really good, compelling case together to get more funding for Placer County projects. So Carrie, I think that one's for you. Yeah, sure. That's, uh, that's one of the things we've been talking about with this uh, uh, Cabin Creek project coming together uh, because we, we, there's just a lot of synergies around it. And we were able to look at a, a sort of a preliminary run of land tender through both our efforts, but also the Truckee River Fire Protection, Truckee Fire Protection District, which has a portion of Placer County in it. And they're using land tender as well. And Cabin, the Cabin Creek area came up as a, a high priority on their assessment as well. So it's it's a way to, we're, we're sort of taking advantage of this before it's fully rolled out, and which is one of the reasons why that project kind of floated to the surface, because it has 
a lot of engagement, a very interested set of partners. There's the synergy with the Forest Service work that's happening uh, right around it. Uh, there's you know some key uh, uniquenesses, if that's a word, to uh, uh, to that facility. It's the only one in of its kind in the area. So if it were to be lost, the replacement uh, impact is huge, and that is one of those factors that uh, that contributes to the weighting in those different objectives uh, and also there are fires that start simply from the the vehicles yeah. going in and out of that facility and it could you know very easily funnel uh, a fire start down into residential areas and other uh, ingress egress routes and, and other important assets so uh, because of the timeline of the cal fire grants that are due in january this is this is one that we feel like we can probably put together and there's there's some county support as well which is also uh, always very appealing to a funder to know that the applicant is putting some some real resources besides just in kind contributions to a project. So we're feeling pretty uh, uh, pretty good about that one. We've had two conversations and we're continuing to meet to to um, prepare an application for that that grant proposal. Great, thank you. That was it, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Supervisor Gore. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you very much for the update and then for the presentation. Appreciate that. And it's great to see um, how much work has been done since we approved it, right? It's yep. just really terrific. And the fact that you might be able to utilize this to get some grant funding next year is terrific. A um, couple things. Carrie, you had mentioned grazing, which, right, um, great idea. Our local jurisdictions do that right now. Um, and so there's an opportunity to do grazing in some of our, you know, like, Creek beds, Dry Creek area, other areas, just a, that's an excellent resource. Um, and then I shared with you, but now that I see Cal Fire and OES in the room, uh, there was, there's a city, there's a company in the city of Roseville, I met with them a couple of weeks ago, and they are a data analytics company. And they were doing a presentation before the Roseville City Council, I think maybe last week. They sent me their presentation, but they have a product that um, senses wildfire so they have sensors throughout a community and then it can determine when a wildfire happens and I thought well that makes sense you could do that in a city without a problem but what about more rural areas and they said we do that too um, and I went that's interesting I I shared with Carrie the slide deck and she thought it might be a neat opportunity to just have Cal Fire OES in your working group uh, perhaps get a presentation from this business just to see if there's a possibility to engage with a product like that where they have sensors and you could actually determine where a, where hot spots are so I will um, maybe I'll just share I'll share that with both of the two of you um, as well and then if it makes sense I'll leave it in your hands thank you any other comments from board members I see none uh, we need to get your name for the record. We know who you are, but for just <laughs> right now, yeah, right. Joe, now. Joe Flannery, and you're with. I'm with Vibrant Planet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I see no more questions or comments from board members. Is there anyone in the public wish to address the board on this? Hello again, uh, Wayne Nader. I just had a couple of comments that I wanted to make. Uh, I appreciate Cindy bringing up about firewise communities. They're really critical. And uh, one that I'd like to highlight is uh, Winchester in, in Meta Vista. Uh, I believe it's been recognized nationally for its effectiveness. Uh, anybody who's been in there a few years back and has been in recently can see the dramatic difference that's gone on there. And I think it's a good model for the rest of our communities in Placer County and their high risk areas to really look at what has been accomplished there. One of the wonderful things is it's done uh, without uh, tax dollars. It's the community makes that investment, each one in their own property, taking those uh, things and getting them done. And so it, it, I just wanted to highlight that. I, I'm glad that uh, Cindy brought that up. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask about is when we remove this material from the forest, uh, the high risk areas that needs to be removed, we obviously need something to do with it. And I know uh, Cabin Creek was mentioned a couple of times, and I'd be interested to find out what the status is. This has been going on for years. 
and I'm hopeful that we're it's closer to actually happening now. Um, we have Rio Bravo, uh, which I hope is still operating. As far as I know, I think it is down in Rockland because they are obviously taking some of this material right now. Uh, a lot of biomass plants in California have shut down, but uh, I think uh, Rio Bravo got a special dispensation to continue so that, because they were getting rid of this high-risk material. So uh, I'd like to know what's happening with Cabin Creek. I think it's uh, an important project that's been long delayed for getting rid of this material. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? That's no one online. No. Uh, do we have an answer about Captain Creek? I don't know anybody here from uh, from what's it? DPW. 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 Yeah, I don't see anybody here, but we can get that information. All right. Yeah, I can offer just a, a brief oh. high-level <clears throat> update. And excuse me. <laughs> The environmental engineering is working on uh, seeking funding for construction. Your board has approved various documentation that allows the project to move forward. Uh, I, I'm not 100% certain where it is on, on securing all of its necessary permits, but I do know that Jared Deck, as the, the project manager, has, uh, I want to say that he's been able to secure, I want to say $6 million, definitely four, but I think it might be six. Uh, toward the construction. So it is definitely a going concern. It is considered a, uh, a live project, so to speak, in, in, in terms of trying to get the funding in order to uh, construct the project. Okay, good. Thank you. All righty. Anything else from the board members? All righty. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you.